I'm here. Hello, I am also here. Oh man, it sure has been an entire week since the last time we recorded one of these. Oh, surely it has. Somehow I have, <laughs> I have managed to keep the exact same clothing on this entire Everyone can week. see that. <laughs> yeah, as you can see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Correct. Uh, so I hope everyone's ready for our review of Morbius. <laughs> um... We're going to steal the idea from that podcast. I think it was called the Super Mario Brothers Minute or something. Uh, it was advertised all the time on our good friend David, his his podcast, uh, Midnight Marinera, mm -hmm. and under, his other podcast, Undercooked Analysis. There was always ads for other podcasts on the network that he was on mm -hmm. and one was called i think it was the super mario brothers minute okay. it might have been the super mario minute and it was this pair of guys who reviewed the super mario brothers movie from was it 1990 91 one minute at a time so every episode was one minute okay so i hope that everyone is ready for probably about three or four years worth of content <laughs> as we go through the morbin minute <laughs> And once more, we are another week out from that meme being relevant, so <laughs> let's push it all the way to August, baby. We're just going to, like, wait till it resurfaces. Yeah. You know, it's, like, it's back to being funny. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it'll be great. Mm -hmm. It'll be, like, Among Us, Amorbius. Yes. Real talk, though, Among Us VR. <laughs> we are not going to get off topic right now. <laughs> all right. But see, that's the funny thing, is that Kylie does not even know what the topic is today. I don't. Um, you, obviously, you have clicked on this either video or this podcast. Let, let's be honest, they let it autoplay. You probably let it autoplay, and you're in for a whale of a time. It's going to be great. <laughs> uh, you, you sort of know what's going on. Kylie doesn't. And I'm very excited. Because a year ago, I wrote this outline, and then the channel went on hiatus, all that good stuff. You already know about it. You mean a day ago. Yes, a day ago. <laughs> well, at this point, it's like a month ago. Okay, a month and a day. Um, so I'm just going to... I might sound a little less off the cuff today, because I'm actually... I am reading from an outline, uh, and Kylie is going to be reacting see this is like this is terrible though i'm a terrible reactor no no this is great this is the melding <laughs> of the infotainment and or ed edutainment and reaction content and podcasting and anime it's great anime oops spoilers we're talking about anime today oh gosh all right so kylie are you familiar and it's okay just just say yes so that if the answer is no, you don't out us and get us in trouble with all the weebs in, in the in the comments. Are you So I'm <laughs> obligated to say yes. <laughs> I love you so much. It's just we communicate so well. <laughs> Are you familiar with the man uh Osamu Tezuka? The the creator of Astro Boy? Uh sometimes known veritably as the god of manga, the god of anime. The father or the godfather of manga. He has a bunch of names. The Disney of Japan. Are you familiar with this man? I, when you said the god of manga, mm -hmm. I really thought you were going to say the god among us. <laughs> the god among us. <laughs> Osamu Tezuka, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we, we're not, we're not going to be talking about the those claims because, you know, in, in recent years, some people have had some some contest to to some of those titles but just for the for the sake for the sake of what we're talking about today let's just he's had that reputation for a long ass time okay yeah i don't big, know who the fuck that is big boy <laughs> do you know who astro boy is yeah kimba I, the white lion i i I'm just I'm just kidding i'm just jungle kidding. emperor <laughs> leo <laughs> all right um so tezuka is who we're talking about today okay uh he was the creator of a number of renowned and beloved manga and anime properties. Um, he was a huge asset in bringing anime and manga into the English-speaking world from a fairly early point. And the point of this intro section that has gone on probably for, you know, half of the episode at this point, uh, is that you can't really escape Tezuka. 
he will find you <laughs> and he will hunt you down <laughs> and Astro Boy will be beamed directly into your skull by the ghost of Tezuka. <laughs> okay. So Tezuka, he was born in 1928. It's a jolly time to be alive, I'm sure. I'm sure nothing bad would come of that. Uh, and he lived until 1989, uh, just like just into the the Heisei period. I'm I'm I think I think I've got my math correct there. Like, so he outlived Emperor Hirohito at least. Boom. <laughs> How are you feeling so far? I'm just listening. <laughs> okay. Um, so he was very interested in animation from a young age. In the 30s and 40s, he got into animation, uh, and he began drawing comics at the ripe young age of nine. What um what animation was there in the 1930s? It's not a lot. At least not a lot that has survived yeah. because of World War II. Yeah. Um, oh, you know that old thing. The main, one of his main inspirations, as far as I could tell, was his father exposing him to Disney films in the 30s and 40s. Okay. So not necessarily a lot of domestic animation. Yeah. But the Disney stuff that was being imported. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. 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 Um, so he continued drawing into his teenage years in spite of... Because he was 16 at the time, uh, he, he he could not be sent into combat. So he got drafted into a, um, a fucking asbestos factory. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so that's great. Um, yeah, nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing bad could come of that, right? Uh. Um, anyway, he got a uh, medical doctorate. Medical? Medical doctorate from, yeah, that's why I said he will hunt you. <laughs> he will murder you. <laughs> Uh, he got a medical doctorate uh, from Osaka University, um, and shortly after the end of World War II, he began serializing his first manga. Um, in the 50s, he got super so, popular. What's okay, up? he started his first manga mm -hmm. after World War II. Yes, in like right after the end of World War II. So... At first, it was a newspaper strip. For what, like 46? Six. Okay, mm -hmm. I was like 44, 40. Whoa. So he was like 46, 28? So... Okay. No, 18. Just... Yes, because he was born in 28. So he, oh, was, yeah. he, so he, was, he was a baby. Yeah, he was. He was a baby. He was, wait, 28, 30. Yeah, okay, yeah, 18. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. Okay, so... I'm just trying to get my timeline straight No, no, straight it's okay, here. it's okay. I don't have a visual, <laughs> a visual cue, okay? So, um... Oh, I apologize. I, I jumped the gun and said that he got his medical doctorate uh, that early. He, you probably can't do that when you're 18, the, typically. Well, <laughs> so in the 50s is, is when he became a doctor. Okay. Um, but also when he started uh, producing his like really popular titles like Mighty Adam or as we know it, Astro Boy, uh, The Jungle Emperor or as we know it, Kimba or as we know it, The Lion King. <laughs> I'm... I'm completely kidding. I know that your movie sucks video came out like two years ago. I, it's, it, it's a joke. It's a joke. Somebody's going to, in the comments, say how wrong I am. <laughs> like they do. So anyway, um, he worked and worked and worked, became this huge guy uh, in 1963. How, like, we talking like seven feet? Yeah. He was humogus huge <laughs> huge <laughs> um in 63 astro boy or you know mighty adam if you want to be that guy about it i apologize i'm american so i know him as astro boy um 1963 the anime adaptation started which as far as i could tell uh please correct me if i'm wrong but multiple sources credited astro boy as being the first serialized tv anime so his that's when he grew to eight feet tall. He got even bigger of a boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. And then, okay, here's a little bit of the twist. Okay. Did you know? Did you know that not only did Tezuka make a bunch of child-friendly entertainment, he also made some more adult-oriented stuff, uh, like... Uh, Buddha uh, is apparently a I've I've not read it. I'm sorry. I'm I'm a sinful child. Um, it's apparently a 
biography of the Buddha in uh, manga form. Um, there's also a work called Message to Adolf, which I don't remember exactly what that one's about, but I would imagine probably has something to do with World War II a little bit. <laughs> um, he also produced several feature films which were considered more like adult adult, you know what I'm saying? Uh, namely the 1001 Nights and Cleopatra. Oh, Cleopatra in an adult adult film. <laughs> in an adult adult animated film, oh, mind you. Okay. Okay. But did you did you know that not only did he have those things in his wheelhouse, but Tezuka his his works coming to America directly led to the creation of the furry fandom. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. So, some, <laughs> wait a minute. Hold something on. I did not tell you about <laughs> is that, did, would you like to would you like the floor? <laughs> no, the floor is lava. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is indeed lava. All right. Explain this one to me. You're going to have to have okay. a lot of like ethos behind this. Okay. So, Tezuka, uh, let me, let me, I'm a little flustered now. You got, you got me, you got me flustered. So, a year ago, when I initially wrote this outline, I actually spoke, uh, with, with a little someone. With the ghost of Tezuka. With the ghost of Tezuka, yeah. Who is at nine night. feet tall. <laughs> He's nine. Sometimes ten. Wow. Um, no, I actually, I actually got in email correspondence with one Mr. Mark Merlino, who I'm sure that name right now doesn't mean anything to you. Names don't mean anything to me ever. Okay, what if I told you literally one of the, like, some people say two, some people say four or five people who created the furry fandom. Wow. Like, who made it what it is essentially and started the first fur con and things like that okay so okay okay but can we just okay hold on <laughs> go ahead well, okay can we just say like the modern iteration of the furry fandom yeah yeah yeah. can we say the, that the, because like the fandom as it is okay that yes. that is fine with me because like i just know we're gonna get somebody coming up on in here in the comments being like well actually and mm -hmm. i just don't want to deal with that shit Mm -hmm. Okay, so the modern iteration of the furry fan. Look, all I'm saying is that if anybody wants to do that, uh, you're gonna I, get blocked. Mar no, that's what's gonna no, happen. No, that's not what's gonna happen. Mark and I follow each other on Twitter. <laughs> oh God! And he is he is a at this point happy birthday, Mark. He is a 70 year old man who does not give a shit. <laughs> Oh, I and love Mark. And he comments. He, I, I want Mark. Like, I, he's not mean. He's no, not, he's not. I love I love Mark already. But he comments on just everything like he <laughs> follows everybody and he 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 will follow you no <laughs> no that's Jessica. um but no mark he's been inspirited by the ghost of Jessica. <laughs> by the ghost of Jessica. the ghost of Jessica is my band name <laughs> um <laughs> but no so mark is more than happy to as as we we talked for like almost a month on and off through oh, email oh that's so cool um he is more than happy to talk about the history of the furry fandom like the furry fandom tm tm yeah so like, like that from from this point forward it's the furry fandom and the tm, TM. is implied <laughs> exactly because i do want to say i would be absolutely shocked mm -hmm. if there weren't like prehistoric furries oh the, the like, first sculpture that we know of that one from france is like that lion man yeah so like, like i mean the sphinx okay yeah and like all that like ancient egyptian oh yeah the like, minotaur come on come on come on so like that is why i want to make abundantly clear oh yeah that we're talking about the furry fandom tm yeah anyway we can move yes. forward now so so um Basically, Merlino explained to me that in the 70s and the 80s, uh, Tezuka was sent around the world by the NHK, which is the biggest, you know, national broadcasting corporation in Japan. Or at least they were at the time. I, I, I think I would they assume still they still are. are yeah. Because they're the national corporation. But so it was for the sake of filming TV specials of his trips, because like he was such a big figure at that point that it was like, 
Oh, he, Tezuka goes to, I don't know, That's when he was seven Brussels. and a half feet. <laughs> yes. It was very difficult to get him on planes. <laughs> <laughs> they had to lay him down in the middle of the aisle. <laughs> so, so, put him in the cargo port. He had to do a, a halo jump like a big boss. <laughs> so, uh, in the 70s, in the late 70s or the early 80s, he ended up in California. And Fred Patton, who is one of the other guys who may or may not be... Basically, there's a group of people who initially started the first furry meetups in fur con. Mark uh, and his partner, Rod O'Reilly, are like, if anybody says there's two of them, it's those two. Mm. Fred Patton and certain others are also included from time to time, but it's like... People can argue about it in the comments. I'm not splitting hairs about it because I frankly recognize that I don't know enough about it to be like, no, these were the founding fathers. <laughs> like <laughs> The founding fathers of furry. Yes. So anyway, he, uh, Fred Patton invited uh, Tezuka to a CFO screening where the rest of the group met him. Now, the CFO was the cartoon slash fantasy organization. It was founded in 1977 in Burbank, California, because of course it was in Burbank, California. Because everything <laughs> animated is in Burbank, California. <laughs> it was an animation appreciation club founded by Merlino, O'Reilly, Fred Patton, Wendell Washer, Judy, I, I apologize, Niver or Niver, and Robin, uh, Robin Lydell. And they would show Umatic recordings, which apparently that is something that even predates VHS. This, I learned a lot researching this. Um, of anime recorded from local stations in Japan by uh, Wendell. So they were already showing anime at this at the CFO meetups. Mm -hmm. And then Fred Patton invited Tezuka to come to one of the meetups and he screened <laughs> Cleopatra for them. <laughs> wow. So basically like a guest, like at a modern day yes. anime convention. Yes. He was invited as a guest. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But it and wasn't... And he brought his adult adult film or anime, Cleopatra, yes. with him. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I have I have several quotes uh, throughout here. The th These are all from Mark Merlino. He says, uh, My point is that I was only interested in collecting as much animation and showing it to as many people as possible. This is how the club got started. You really can't analyze, critique, research, and editorialize about animation if you don't see it first. The late 70s was, to borrow a famous quote, a vast wasteland as far as animation production was as, as far as animation production was going in the US. The Japanese were doing amazingly entertaining shows and films for similar markets, working under similar budgets. Quality writing, characters with personality and depth, amazingly clear art and camera tricks, quote unquote, all produced wonderful media. Now access to quote unquote anime, as it became known, is common all over the world, even in the traditionally anti-foreign U.S. I realized that I really didn't need to be personally involved in the showing animation to people as long as people were seeing it. Um, that way, I and my friends got the ball rolling. Oh, I'm sorry. That I and my friends got the ball rolling is something I'm extremely proud of. So, essentially, Tezuka and the CFO were both instrumental in anime, like, coming to America in the capacity that it did. Because, mm -hmm. you know, in the 80s, it was like, there's kind of a market for it here, but not like a ton, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, uh, let's see. So then the club grew to the point of prominence that Merlino was asked to pass out questionnaires concerning a copy of the Castle of Cagliostro, which was the loop in the third film that Hayao Miyazaki did before founding Studio Ghibli, um, which... Toho provided screenings of Castle of Cagliostro for conventions because by that point, conventions were starting to be more of a thing. Mm -hmm. So basically, the CFO was very important at that point, at least, you know, in California with like as, as kind of a almost as kind of a go between in a way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So in 1980, Tezuka came back to attend Comic-Con. And <laughs> this time around, when Tezuka visited the CFO, things were much more relaxed as he brought his animation students from Japan to visit his quote-unquote American family. Oh, wow. So, like, they were already, like, you know, they were, they were, they were cool with each other. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and then 
Merlino was was very proud to also mention that uh let's see the group grew close with Merlino relating a VIP event at Comic-Con where Tezuka complimented Merlino's skill tear which is an original species that he made like forever ago like in the 70s and inquired about using them in an upcoming Astro Boy reboot so like my point is they were cool you know yeah so then the furry fandom TM officially kicked off in 1985, mainly with room parties. And then the first furry convention, uh, Conference Zero, was held in 1989. And as far as I could tell, any furry historians in the comments, please let me know if I'm incorrect on this. That was the only convention for a decade? Like, there wasn't another one until 1999? Whoa. That's, as far as I could tell, that, that was what was going on. So, Merlino says... Uh, my partner Rod and I were hosting room parties at fan conventions for people who liked animal characters. One regular, very popular series of parties happened in San Jose at the local San- science fiction club's convention, Baycon. By 1988, the anime fans had turned Baycon into the largest annual anime screening in the U.S. There were multiple screening rooms running programs all day and most of the night, and complete, detailed, free publications with descriptions of the shows and features shown. At this point, the staff of Bacon asked, very politely, if maybe they could start their own convention, instead of taking over theirs. The following year, the first anime convention happened in San Francisco. Rod and I thought, hey, maybe it's time for a furry convention. So in 1989, we organized, with a question mark, Conference (laughs) Zero. The name Conference was a word pun, like many science fiction or fantasy conventions have been using traditionally, like Conjecture, Leprechaun, Confluence... For nearly 10 years, conference was the only furry convention. So he also corroborated that then. So just scratch what I said earlier. (laughs) I haven't looked at this outline in a little while. So you might be asking me, though. Okay, you might be saying, okay, it sounds sounds like Tezuka had a lot to do with bringing anime to the U.S. Yeah. And that, like, Mark Merlino, uh, Rod O'Reilly. And he liked some, like, furry characters. Yes. That he saw. Right. And you and that the the CFO helped in a lot of ways with that initial like seeding of anime at least into the West Coast, right? Yeah. Okay. Here's where it gets spicy. Okay, I was like, okay, where's the connection? We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna draw it all tie, together. Tie okay? it all together in a nice little bow. Okay, so Tezuka passed away in 1989, uh, leaving a mark on the manga and anime industries. I was very succinct in this outline. Um, (laughs) A museum was established in his honor, catalogs of his work were meticulously compiled, and for decades since, his work has been translated and continued to be passed around. 25 years later, alright, so we're talking the mid-2010s, his daughter, Rumiko Tezuka, set the world ablaze when in early 2014 she tweeted some findings which had been locked in her father's desk for some indeterminate amount of time. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Sketches of characters, chocolate... And uh, vintage, I'm sure, finely <laughs> aged. That's some finely aged chocolate. That's like you pull that chocolate out, and it's not even brown anymore. It's like that, like chalky, it's, like yes, <laughs> like, yes. it's like lost that, all of its moisture. That beige color, yes. it's like it just crumbles. <laughs> That's some vintage chocolate. It has returned to cocoa powder. Yes, the ghost of Tezuka's chocolate. <laughs> That's what was haunting me this morning when I had a stomach. <laughs> So, sketches of characters, chocolate, an essay on a fellow artist, and perhaps, most importantly, a set of lewd mouse furry art. What, as well as what appears to have been transformation art, which, if you know about uh, the furries and the, the... fetishes what <laughs> you know is this like an is it rl stein isn't it is rl stein a furry <laughs> whoa Wait, maybe i have I, i'm so bad at names what who wrote the the books that were the people turned into animals oh gosh uh k a k a applegate oh okay it's not you, rl you, who were what did RL, animals what did rl yeah goosebumps oh goosebumps <laughs> Okay, there might have been a goosebumps look where somebody turned there, into an animal. Probably. To be fair. And that probably awakened something <laughs> in a lot of millennials. <laughs> okay, anyway. But So anyway, a couple years later in 2016, 29 images from his desk were published in the literary magazine Shincho, including the furry mouse girl. 
And let me say, they're spicy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we're going to have to look the, them up now. So this led we're to... We're going to have to like, put a link in the description. <laughs> oh, we just, okay. I mean, I'll put her in the thumbnail. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. Um, so this led to a minor reckoning, as I put it, uh, with multiple articles published in English asking what this meant... Uh, what this meant... I don't know what I wrote here. <laughs> what it would have meant if Tezuka were a part of the furry fandom. Like, not just a tangential, you mm-hmm. know, part like he mm-hmm. had been assumed to be. Mm-hmm. Some called attention to the fact that this may have merely been a logical step in terms of lewdness and anthropomorphism. <laughs> Given the history of Disney, Tom and Jerry, etc. And how many of these early anthro characters had a sexual dimension to them. So why not Tezuka's? Because, I mean, mm. let's be honest. If you look at that stuff from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, they're acting sussy. Have you have you seen, like, how, how lewd some of that some of that early stuff gets? Like Tom and Jerry? Or? Not necessarily, like, Tom and... Well, honestly, probably Tom and Jerry to an extent. But you mean stuff earlier. Mm-hmm. Like old cartoons. Mm-hmm. Like Cuphead cartoons. Yeah. Like, from what Cuphead like was inspired. Like, that era. Yeah. 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 Like, how... how sexual some of them get you know without being directly like just people in the 50s were just horny as shit yeah isn't that why the baby boomers are a thing or... i thought that was because world war ii happened and then everyone was depressed and they were like well sex makes me feel good i'm sorry <laughs> that got really dark i'm I sorry just think, i think everyone just is was just a lot horny I think I think everyone is a lot horny now. Have you been on Twitter recently? I try not to be. <laughs> okay. Real question. How many furries do you follow on Twitter? <laughs> um but uh, side note, pro tip, uh if you don't want the world to just like crush you with horrible news all of the time, follow furries. Only following furries on social media is great. Yep. Furries are awesome. I'm just saying. Um so <laughs> Uh, commenters were quick to call attention to how the aforementioned Fred Patton and others who were there at the beginning of the American anime fandom and furry fandom were on personal terms with Tezuka during his life, not to mention how a number of his works involved varying levels of anthro art, meaning that this was par for the cur- course, curse, merely a merging of the lewd adult works that he had already done in the ant- animal-centered kid works that he had done. Mm-hmm. And questioning if modern fans are familiar with any of his work outside of Astro Boy. Called out. Um, (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. I knew about Kimba. Um, In fact, some histories of the furry fandom placed Tezuka's 60s anime works squarely as the seed from which the fandom would later grow. Why do I keep using the word seed in this episode? (laughs) Works like Kimba, which were syndicated in the U.S. as early as the 60s, and other works from, from Mushi, from the animation studio, like The Amazing Three, also written as a manga by Tezuka, but he wasn't involved with the anime predating even other influences on the furry fandom like Fritz the Cat or Watership Down. So basically, the argument went, Tezuka was basically already doing furry shit in the 60s. That's why I love Watership Down. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. It makes so much sense. It makes sense. so much sense. Like, but also, Watership Down just fucking slaps. Oh, Watership Down is like... in the He slaps you in the face. Top, top 10, top 5 best mm-hmm. books. Oh, I thought you were going to say animated movies. I mean, I do. I, the, the the old one? Mm-hmm. Oof. It's awful. Oh, like, God. I mean, in a good way. But honestly, the Netflix one is actually pretty good, too. Yeah, everybody dunks on that yeah, one. Yeah, I don't know why. Like, I think because like, they're like, oh, the animation's bad. The animation's bad. And I'm like, close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we can't do stuff like this. I'm too spicy. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. All right. See, the, you say you're not a good reactor. You're totally a good reactor. In fact... Further research shows that early influencers within the furry fandom of the 1980s, like Rod O'Reilly and Mark Merlino, uh, were passing around Tesco material to new furries more so than Disney, even. Mm. They were they were like, no, I got the good shit. Mm-hmm. Including notable examples that are left out of the broad Tesco discourse, at least in English, like Pincho from Phoenix2772, who I should also put in the thumbnail, and Boggy. The the title character of Boggy the Monster of the Mighty of Boggy the Monster of Mighty Nature. Good Lord! You are just tongue tied today. I am tongue tied. <laughs> I'm the 
<laughs> yeah, there we go. That, the case in point, we're the, done here. The lewd, the lewd uh, mouse art got me. <laughs> <laughs> got me acting unwise. <laughs> um, so basically, the argument goes: the material was already there, and that the nobody should have been surprised that he was drawn some some lewd sussy mouse art, mm-hmm. basically. So. With a couple, got, I got I got a, a block of quotes here because I guess I just decided that Mark, I mean, Mark is a very insightful man and he says a lot. And I was like, I'm not going to be able to word any of this better. So we're, right. gonna, we're, we're just so, going to read Mark's words. As for Tezuka's direct hand in the furry fandom, Merlino had this to say. The initial exposure of fans in the U.S. to animation from Japan that was not modified for the TV market in the 50s and 60s including animated features like The White Snake, Jack and the Witch, Alakazam the Great, Pinocchio in Outer Space, which sounds fantastic as an aside, <laughs> etc., and television shows like Gigantor, Amazing 3, Astro Boy, Kim of the White Lion, Speed Racer, etc., was due to the CFO and private film or video collectors. It got going in 1977, at least eight years before the first quote-unquote furry party at a fan convention. Dr. Tezuka passed away in 1989, the year of Conference Zero, the first furry convention. Were a lot of people who would become furries involved in Japanese animation fandom? Yes. But interestingly enough, there was little quote-unquote furry manga and animation in the mass of film and TV content. What was furry were mainly shows and films specifically for children. I spoke to a Japanese furry fan one time at a convention, I wish I remembered his name, And he told me that furries in Japan were nervous about being out to their peers because anything with animal characters was considered childish. Which, honestly... That makes sense for Japan. Well, I feel like like there's still a certain amount of that stigma here. I mean, most of the stigma against furries in America is that they're too horny. But but even, like... Well, yeah, but I mean, like, in Japan, like, (laughs) you don't even, like, want to be perceived as a weeb. That's true. Like, you don't don't even watch anime. Yeah, you don't want to be an otaku of any kind. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's fair. That's fair. I mean, that again. I do not live in Japan. No, I've but never our been perception. To Japan. Of it. My perception of it, based on the media that I consume, mm-hmm. and having learned Japanese and mm-hmm. not completely, and mm-hmm. you know, you know, spoken with people in Japan who live in Japan. Yeah. That is the perception that I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I agree with that, and honestly, thinking about it, I do feel like there is still a certain amount of that, like. It's not even animal characters, though. It's just animation in general. There's still a certain amount of stigma with older people, mainly in the U.S. Yeah, I've that, definitely noticed that. that like, like, oh, that's a cartoon. That's a that's a kid's show. That's... Ugh. And it's like... King of the Hill? <laughs> <laughs> Watership uh... Down? That's that's baby shit. Wait, are you saying King of the Hill is part of the furry fandom? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying that the argument that a lot of people I've interacted with, that animation is inherently for children yeah. is absolutely ridiculous like well yeah when there when there is animation and in, like inherently made for adults for adults yeah, yeah exactly but, but people just see that it's animated and think oh that's kids stuff yeah and it's like nah nah bro nah <laughs> so Merlita went on to say Dr. Tezuka created a lot of content that involved animal animal characters not animated the, a lot of them were animated too And a lot of furries got their quote-unquote inspiration from his work. After Bambi, which I became obsessed with at four, Kimba the White Lion was my droga. (laughs) He actually said drug. I'm sorry. I should not misquote him. I liked a lot of the characters, Kimba and Kitty and Kimba's older cousin, Leona. They were cute and sexy, confirming my bi-ness. Rodney was enamored with Robin Hood, which as a side note, who the fuck wasn't as, I, as a kid? If, if you weren't, you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but also with the characters in Amazing 3, particularly Bonnie Bunny, the captain of the alien research team in Earth Rabbit form. She was very cute and, all caps and, also sexy. <laughs> then there was Boggy, who you remember mentioned earlier, the genetic manipulated pet cat of the main character who grew up to be one damn sexy feline woman. Her dance for our hero was pure seduction. And in Cleopatra, Queen of Sex, which I forgot to mention, that was the subtitle of Cleopatra. Of course it was. In some, it, I, I don't think it was initially. I think in Japanese it was just like Cleopatra, 
or something. Sekushi. But, <laughs> Sekushi. <laughs> but I think when it was like adapted, you know, um, the Jin characters take on animal forms to seduce humans. So, I, again, it's, I feel like this echoes a lot of what I've heard other people say too. Is that it's that that meme of like. Oh boy, I hope this doesn't awaken anything in me. <laughs> and then, you know. And then you watch Bambi. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Bambi's pretty good though. Oh, I I I, I that wasn't a joke. No, I I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Look, okay, personally, personally hot take, a lot of classic Disney movies like pre-70s, they're kind of boring. Bambi is pretty good though. Like what? Snow White? <laughs> I understand. So, I understand. It's innovative. It was a so huge step forward the for biggest, film. The biggest thing for me are, is that those particular movies, mm -hmm. the art in them is oh, yeah? just like overwhelmingly beautiful. That's fair. Okay. I thought you were going to say the art. Like, come on, Disney. Couldn't you have done better? <laughs> no. No, that was like peak. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. It was that's like fair. peak. Like, you They're don't, very pretty. Like, you uh, don't see that anymore. Bambi, too. Oh, Bambi. Absolutely. Like, the backgrounds in Bambi Sleeping are fantastic. Beauty? Oh, yeah, Sleeping Beauty is that old, isn't it? Yeah. I forget that that one's that old. But anyway. Look, all I'm saying, Dark Cauldron is peak and it is severely underrated. <laughs> Look, that's all I'm saying. Have you seen the Dark Cauldron? Of course. It scarred me. Who didn't As it scar? It <laughs> me. <laughs> no. It scarred you. It, it ruined me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, final quote. Final quote. Bring it all together. All right. <sighs> Here it is. Thesis statement restated through the words of another. All right. There was the relatively recent reveal of Dr. Tezuka's sketches of sexy mice. I own the 300 volumes of the complete manga of Dr. Tezuka, and some of the books have animal characters. Many are very attractive in Dr. Tezuka's style. One could come to the conclusion that Dr. Tezuka himself liked cute slash sexy animal characters. He told me that he liked my skills hair. Maybe. Just maybe. Dr. Tezuka was a furry. <laughs> Boom. There you go. Cut. That's it. That's the episode. One of the founding fathers, founding furthers of, of the fandom. You just said that. Yep. <laughs> yep. Saying, on record, Osama Tezuka, maybe, was a furry. <laughs> was a furry asterisk. Maybe. But... So yeah, I hope we all learned a lot here today. That was actually this, quite cool. Yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you. I um, that's awesome that you were able to talk with Mark. Yeah, that's, he's he's like, great. And Mark, I'm sure I'm sure that you'll listen to this at some point, or well, I would hope you would because I'm gonna send this to you. <laughs> um, but and you're so like super involved still in the fandom and everything. So like I'm sure at some point you will hear this. I I do, I really appreciate all of the time and all of the all of the information that you provided for this because like seriously that was a massive asset literally a year ago i was like i want to start doing these like topic episodes mm -hmm. that aren't specific to a single movie or a show or something mm -hmm. and i came across one of those news articles about the lewd mouse furry art or yeah. fursona art and i was like this would make a really interesting episode and then I just happened to be able to get in touch with him and that like <clears throat> this would not nearly have been as filled out as it was if if I hadn't been able to get in touch with you and if you had not agreed to let me interview you. So I greatly appreciate that. Uh, he's great. He's a great active Twitter account. Go go follow Mark Merlino on Twitter. I'll put it in the description. Um, but yeah. It's... Case closed. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Do you have any additional thoughts now that you've gone on this roller coaster? Um, mm -hmm. Go follow furries. Yeah. Furries are awesome. Honestly. Yeah. That's all there is to say about it. Yeah, uh, thank you for all the information. That was really cool. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a thinker. It's a, it's a thinker. It's a stinker. <laughs> and I think uh, a lot of the comments under this video uh, will be very telling about... How 
spicy of a topic this might have been. Because I don't know if this is a spicy topic or not. I picked it because I thought it'd be fun. Knowing people, mm. this is spicy. Th- this might this, be spicy. This is like... This is like a Sichuan, like <laughs> we, we, we put a little too many Sichuan chilies in, mm-hmm. in the, in the stock. And, just, just a little, yep. you know, so some people are going to like it because it's nice and spicy, but some people are not going to appreciate it. Just remember your comment could be sent to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't send them to him. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm no, just no, kidding. no. But yes, thank you everybody for listening. If you're listening on YouTube, don't forget down in the description, you can also follow us on spotify if you just want to listen on there um and if you're on spotify our main thing is running a youtube channel we got tons of other videos on there that are not over here and they're great and you should go watch them listen to them watch them do what you want you know and uh i think that that meets the quota this month of 50 percent of the videos me talking about furries in them. <laughs> yep. We so, just have um, to meet our other quota of 50% Morbius, and then yep. we'll be good. Yep. So uh, we'll see you all next week on the next episode of the Morbin Minute, uh, where we will be talking about the second minute of Morbius. And I'll probably find a way to talk about furries there, too. Have a great week, everybody. Bye. <laughs>